<clears throat> I can hear you crystal clear. Yeah, it sounds really good. I have to say, it's really nice. No <laughs> joke. I, I still can't get over these new mics, though. I used my old one for a, a video call the other day, and it was noticeably different, and I got disappointed. I think, okay, I got to bust out the good one. I'm going to be really curious to really see whether I can hear a difference. I promise you, you're going to notice it. Hi there. Welcome to From Know How to Wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. IIoT. Industrial Internet of Things. Chuck. AI. Artificial intelligence, of course. <laughs> Cloud computing. OEE. Overall equipment effectiveness. Ooh, good one. Right? Hello, listeners. This episode is going to be buzzword heavy. But don't worry, we'll put plenty of substance behind those terms. Let's see if we can challenge you guys. I prepared my buzzword bingo card, Jeff. Let's start. You can find these words either on Shuko's bingo cards or in any management magazine. But digitalization doesn't start with reading about it or just visiting conferences. Unless you don't start to actually digitalize every aspect of your company, you won't succeed. It's not always easy to make the transition to digital, and it's especially true for many businesses manufacturers particularly. They have production lines and machines that have been running for decades, maybe, and that are not ready for the digital age. But it is possible to digitize production, whether it's in a hyper-modern factory or on a process relying on legacy machines. That's what we're going to explore today. But so if I want to digitize my factory, what's the first step, Jeff? Oh, that's easy. The first step is to call Marian Demma. <laughs> I go to the customers and we are tackling together challenges in the digitalization manufacturing sector. Marian is a senior solutions architect for IIoT at the Bosch Connected Industry. IIoT. We already had this one, so check. Checks. So Marian specializes in IIoT solutions. Basically, it's not about connected devices, but connected machines. That's right. And Marian is connecting the machines, if you will. But, you know, digitalizing a machine, or rather the, the production line or an entire plant, is a huge, monumental task. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and of course, there's, there's quite a lot at stake. I would say has read from digitalization in the latest manager magazine <laughs> and have visited a conference where people are telling that when they do not start with digitalization, the company will not exist anymore in, I don't know, five or ten years. <laughs> and Marianne is, is exaggerating just a little bit, of course. Yeah, but I have definitely heard people say that. Well, yeah, and, and you know, there, there might be some, some truth to it, but that doesn't really help anybody. Uh, and then there's the other fictional extreme. And on the other hand, there are companies who have initiated like 10 studies on digitalization <laughs> and know exactly what they want to do. They might know what they want to do, but they might not know how to do it exactly. Let's see. Um, let's install some sensors, gather some data, mm -hmm. connect everything to the cloud. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And and Marian says that's a that's a trap that that he himself often falls into. I find myself often in the trap that I'm thinking too technical when talking about digitalization. And when you ask me about challenges directly in my mind, technical potential issues pop up. What he means is that technology is only one aspect of it all. He can think of three key aspects that make a digitalization project really successful. Culture, organization, and technical challenges. Technical challenges come last. I suppose it's because they might be easier to solve than the cultural or organizational <laughs> issues. I was just thinking the same. <laughs> I can change and improve a technical solution in a couple of hours with some lines of software code, but it takes much longer to change organization or even a whole company or mm -hmm. department culture. Exactly. And so when Marian helps a manufacturing company with the digitalization process, he tries to involve everyone from the start. Yes, digitalization is also about automation. I think everyone knows this. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work without the people, without the experts who know every single step of the process like the back of their hand. 
it is extremely important to have all stakeholders involved. And this means not only the people from the shop floor, maybe from the maintenance department, product quality department, but also the IT guys from the IT department, because there is in most of the cases an existing IT landscape and we have to integrate our solution into this existing IT landscape to create some value. And when he says our solution, he means Nexit, right? That's what Bosch Connected Industries' IoT software portfolio is called. Nexit, exactly. You can think of Nexit as basically the brain of a digital factory. It's collecting all the data, and then it analyzes all the data. And with that, it can point out problems, or it can help with logistics and make sure that necessary parts are in the right place at the right time. Nexeed automates machines, collects, harmonizes, and visualizes data from Intralogistics and the shop floor. But Intralogistics is just one daily challenge that many of you production folks and quality managers and production <laughs> managers and shop floor managers and maintenance managers and business managers, everyone's got their own problems to solve. So a whole lot of managers. Yeah, well, you know, things need to be managed. <laughs> Nexit addresses the challenges and the pain points of the respective user groups. Mm -hmm. The modules can be configured and assembled according to the individual needs. And this way, Nexit offers the specific user groups all the tools they need for everyday use. What's interesting is that it relies on one pool of data, the same source of truth, so to speak. So different people with different roles can derive different types of information from that data. For example, in a maintenance use case, our task is to predict certain events, maybe failures in the future, and inform the maintenance department at the right time. And we analyze the data and give the user the best feedback and uh, prediction when a machine is um, going to fail. And um, based on this analysis, he or she can plan the maintenance window accordingly. That reminded me just now of the uh, first episode we did on SoundSea, where they talked about predicting machine failures. It was just a, just a side note. Anyway, back to Marian's comment. Together, based on this data, the people working in different roles at a company can make its processes and even its key performance indicators more transparent and can optimize processes. That is specifically working to make them more efficient while also increasing product quality. Key performance indicators. Noted. <laughs> but seriously, I think this also illustrates the changes in organization and culture that Marian mentioned earlier, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't do maintenance following a predetermined schedule anymore. Like you would have your car inspected every, what, 3,000 kilometers or do an oil change <laughs> once a year. Should. Um, I would hope so. Cars... <laughs> As cars have gotten more sensors, the inspection schedules have become also more flexible. So you could get new brake pads when the light in the dashboard tells you to. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with machine parts in a modern factory. But it does mean that in addition to bringing the machines up to snuff, there also needs to be a shift in how people think about and I suppose approach their work. Yeah, exactly. And Marian keeps saying... Installing fancy digital technology only makes sense when everybody is actually on board with it. Exactly. There's a change in the daily life of a maintenance worker in the factory. And without this change, the solution is without value, without any value. I mean, we can predict with the best analysis and predict the best results and provide the information. Mm -hmm. But if there's no change in the organization, the whole solution is without value. And I think Marian makes it perfectly clear that IIoT, or Industry 4.0 as it's often called in Europe. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Industry 4.0. Check. Right, yes, one more button. <laughs> uh, that this is, this is really about people and machines working closer together. People are better informed about the state of the machines so they can make better decisions about how to fix problems. And at the same time, a system like Nexeed needs the expert knowledge to be most useful. Currently, we're developing Nexeed modules, which use AI to provide more efficient analytics. Um, I will name one example from Titan. The Titan process basically consists of two measurement series 
torque and angle, and of course, some metadata such as the result and part ID and so on. And all processes are analyzed automatically by Nexeed in near real time. And after a couple of processes, it is um, necessary to name the anomalies. Afterwards, they can be grouped and those creates transparency for the expert. And the expert does have the option of visual comparison with other processes. And this enables plausibility checks, refinement and customization of the analysis by introducing expert knowledge. And this is why expert knowledge is even more important than before, I would say. So to summarize, machines and sensors are collecting the data. And these can be sensors built into the modern machinery or sensors retrofitted to an older machine. That's also something for Madian and his team to do. They help with the planning and the installation of the sensors and other hardware wherever necessary. Next, the software, Nexeed, aggregates the sensor data. It offers different views of it, can ring an alarm when something seems off. But then, to interpret this information, to understand what's really going on, and to figure out the appropriate actions, you still need the people to know really what they're doing. Right. So IIoT, if I may use a buzzword myself, By all means. is so much more than just connecting a machine to a network. Jeff, I feel a little sad playing the buzzword bingo alone. You know, I know you'd love to play, right? Did you people prepare something in secret? I've prepared some questions about <gasps> the state of digitalization. To be more specific, digitalization in manufacturing. Oh, okay. Because I found myself wondering, we've been talking about this kind of stuff for quite a while now, and yeah. I assume none of our listeners are hearing about industrial IoT for the first time today. That's a safe bet. So is it just buzzwords and hot air, or to what extent is it actually happening in the real world? I thought one indicator for the grade of digitalization might be to look at automatization. And by that, I mean robots. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, what do you think? How many industrial robots are at work around the globe? 4 million, 40 million, or 400 million industrial robots worldwide? Mm, I'll go with 40. 40 million. Noted. What you don't know yet, you're not the only contestant in this quiz. Your competitor is Marianne. Ooh. So, Marianne. 4 million, 40 million, or 400 million robots? Oh, big numbers. I would say uh, the last one, 400 million. Okay. <laughs> see, because see, I, I thought about that for a second, then I realized that's, that's greater than the population of the U.S., which seems a little aggressive. I'll go with 40. <laughs> okay. So um, both of you are wrong. The correct answer is just 4 million. Uh -huh. So industrial robots are not actually that common, it seems. But on the other hand, this number translates to about 13 robots per thousand people who work in manufacturing. Huh. That's, so that's, that's, a, a good ratio. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that figure. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I didn't know that. Next question. Another indicator for the degree of digitalization is the use of cloud computing. Mm -hmm. So what percentage of manufacturers use cloud computing? And just a bit of a warning, I couldn't find a global number, so this is based on an EU survey. Mm -hmm. So again, what percentage of manufacturers in the European Union use cloud computing? 30%, 40%, or more than 50%? I would, I, and, and now I say this as an IT guy thinking about where we have our, our solutions based these days, <laughs> I, I would say it's, it's only 30%. Hmm, okay, and Marian? 30%, I would say less than 30%. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with him here. Uh, and, and not to be a snob about it, but, but the EU traditionally is, is lagging a little bit here, and, and uh, understandably so. I see great benefits coming with cloud technology, but I see also that many manufacturers are very skeptical when it comes to cloud technology, that their data will be stolen or fear that their data is not anymore stored in their own data center. Yeah, 
yeah, people still really, really like on-premise solutions and everyone wants to hoard their data like the the dragon's gold in the mountain. But uh, yeah, but of course, to be fair, cloud computing really does have many advantages. Uh, I mean, when it comes to flexibility, speed, cost, for a system like Nexseed, uh, it really is the natural way of storing and processing all that data that it's gathering. But I think it's also the fear of something new, not really knowing, not having control potentially, or not seeing the control that you have that kind of pushes yeah. this fear. I totally understand, yeah. though, the advantages as well. It's tough calling some of that stuff new anymore, though, to be honest. True, but, true. You're yeah. absolutely right. <laughs> but you need the right concepts, of course, for privacy, for IT security. And if you have both in mind, privacy and data security, then cloud is a uh, really, really positive thing. As a as a data security professional, I, I can only agree with that. Uh, but anyway, uh, Marian says that he and his team have many, many discussions about this exactly mm. when they need to bring Nexseed to a customer. Often it's it's not even technical discussions, but legal discussions as well. So it's a complicated issue. I can totally understand and get that. Um, but getting back to my quiz, because that's also quite important. Um, so you said about 30% or less than 30%. Um, and mm -hmm. actually, Marian and you were, were uh, aligned on that answer. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually around 40%. Wow. Hey. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. That's good news for everybody. <laughs> but, but also, uh, to be fair, um, cloud computing can mean so many different things. I mean, this is, this is a technical discussion, after all. Um, maybe some of those companies are, are just having their email and calendars in the cloud. So that's hardly digitizing manufacturing. Which is actually a great comment. So um, the level of cloud maturity is important. One recent study confirmed actually that the maturity of cloud solutions used in manufacturing companies kind of varies across the business units. Um, so sure. traditionally in the IT department or in the administration, the use of more mature cloud solutions might be more widespread, um, mm -hmm. if I can say so. But how many companies do you think reported a high level of cloud maturity on their shop floor? Let's make that a free guess. Whoever is closer to the actual number gets the point. How many companies reported a high level of cloud maturity, of cloud maturity on their shop floor? Exactly. It's globally. I would say, oof, I'm going to say 60%. Self-reported, because people tend to be optimistic. <laughs> okay, and Marianne? I would say oh, maybe 10%, maybe less. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and here's where we come apart, okay. So there's at least one time where you guys definitely have, there's a, there's quite a big gap between the both of you. So um, drum roll, please. The big surprise, it's actually 36% that use, as uh, this study calls it, highly mature cloud solutions huh? for manufacturing. Such a good number. Wow. Okay. Hey, hey, there was a wow in there. Wow. Interesting. Well, both of you tackled my digitalization challenge pretty well, and but nobody's the winner. <laughs> 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 or I would say in this case, God. actually, Marion's the winner because he was closer from a percentage perspective on the last question. No, but those were really good questions, though. It was very interesting. Let's have a look at what a digitalized production actually is like. Of course, Bosch, as the developer of Nexseed, also uses it wherever possible to optimize our own production lines. And that's how Nexseed got started. We needed ourselves an I IoT software portfolio, so we created one. This is how things so often happen in this organization, <laughs> as big as Bosch is. Um, in the now, true spirit of Bosch. <laughs> yeah, uh, no kidding. Um, we'll just do it ourselves. Um, but now, Nexseed is actually available for external customers as well. Mm -hmm. So they can get a certainly well-tested software that's used live in production in Bosch plants all over the world. And that's actually a good point because we have about 200,000 people that use Nexseed inside of Bosch. Um, mm -hmm. So as you commented, it is well tested and we definitely know what we're doing. True, of course. And the folks at Nexseed keep developing it that way. New cutting edge functions and modules, as Marian already mentioned, are often first introduced internally. Mm -hmm. And that way before they're adjusted and packaged for the external market. 
and one of those internal users is Tobias Pfister. He is responsible for tech at Bosch's Bamberg plant in Bavaria. At the moment, I am the team lead of the MES team in the TEF department here in Bamberg. But at the beginning of the whole HDV6 project back in 2017, I was responsible for the MES in the HDV6. So looking back at my bingo card, MES is definitely on it. Mm -hmm. And it stands for Manufacturing Execution System. Yep. Um, and it's one of the functionalities of Nexseed. However, mm -hmm. HDEV6, I believe it was, is not anything I had ever heard before. Yeah, that one threw me off as well. Although from what I can kind of gather with plant and stuff, it's definitely a part they produce. <laughs> the HDV6 is the sixth generation of a high-pressure fuel injection valve. And it injects the gasoline with a maximum pressure of around 350 bars directly into the combustion chamber. And with this technique, it's possible to reach the newest emission standards. Okay. So it's one small part that goes into the internal combustion engine for cars. Exactly. So to build these valves, they built in a new production line in Bamberg. And um, the line is, I would say, 100 meters long. That's about the size of a football field for my American friends. That, that's very big. And additionally to that, it's fully automated. Um, we want it faster, we want more, we want it better. <laughs> As always. All at the same time. And we wanted to be as efficient as possible. So HGV6 became a pilot line for full connectivity to realize that industry 4.0 mindset. So how can Nixseed actually help and meet these goals? Um, so we heard make production faster and better. Tobias tells us about three challenges to illustrate this. And one of those is ramping up the production of the new lines as quickly as possible. We see that our OEE, perhaps, I think it's the most famous metric we get. OEE, the overall equipment effectiveness. We see that we increased it with the help of the data in a very short time. So 100% OEE would mean that they produce only good parts. And at the maximum speed without interruption, thus using the full potential of that equipment. And the data helped identify and get rid of the kinks quite quickly. Um, so Tobias says compared to the previous production generation called HDEV5, naturally, uh, they were able to increase the OEE much faster and bring it up to a higher level. And at the same time, they managed to reduce the in-cycle time. So he says it's clearly connected to the use of Nexseed. Challenge number two is related to becoming more aware of malfunctions early and not only fixing the problem, but truly addressing the root cause. And for that, you need to know how much data they're actually collecting. We have around 1,000 parameters per part. Another wow. <laughs> yeah, wow, which is why you need software to do it, because no human can do that. Yep. Exactly. And every single one of those valves has its own record in the database with a thousand data points. Every time a part sees any stations or any process is done on that part, all parameters which we get there, like pressing curves or any height measurements and something like that, will be sent to the MES system and will be stored there. And what kind of volume are we talking about here? How many valves are they producing? Currently, we produce up to three and a half million parts per line and year. Whoa. Currently, we have four high volume lines in Bamberg. And so we produce many HGV6 injectors and also create a huge amount of data. Yeah, okay. So talking about the data, so let's, let's do the math here. Um, so there's three and a half million parts per line, mm -hmm. four lines running, so mm -hmm. 14 million parts per year, mm -hmm. and they said there's a thousand data points per part, so... Let me help you there, because Tobias estimates that over the lifespan of those manufacturing lines, they'll generate about one petabyte of data. Which is one million gigabytes. And that's just the raw data. It's all text, no graphs. No images. Just the good stuff. So they have these track records of all of the valves that were produced, all of them. 
And that means when a problem occurs, they can now identify why it occurred. We have full traceability of all components and parts within the production. So we can check for correlations and influence of external or, or internal processes. And we can see, okay, we have several NOK parts. What's the problem? And perhaps we can see, okay, every NOK parts came from one batch of one manufacturer of a component. And I think that's the greatest benefit of the whole system. Hmm. Um, so this is actually quite disappointing. I don't have oh. NOK on my bingo card. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not very technical. Uh, it simply means not OK, right? Yeah, no, it, definitely. But I mean, he's using an acronym <laughs> and I was hoping that I could film. I, I want to have a bingo at the end of this episode, okay? <laughs> so okay. that's right. And okay means not okay. And there's another way Nixseed helps solving issues. For instance, um, if they notice that an error occurs, not only once, but repeatedly, instead of quickly fixing, let's say, a malfunctioning gripper on a machine, they can use the data to get hints of why this gripper throws an error. So Tobias talked about driving up efficiency, the OEE and solving issues and reducing interruptions with the help of Nexeed. Is that just because everything is more automated and steered by the software? Kinda. So it's that, but it's not just that. <laughs> Got it. It's also about people making better decisions based on software or based on the data. Yeah. Um, the shift in thinking that Marianne described earlier, Tobias has actually seen happen. The first question from people should be, let's look at the data and not, let's look at the line. So when there's a problem, the data will tell you more about it than the actual machine. So that was the problem fixing challenge. And since you mentioned automation, here's one example of how Nexeed made it happen. So we have only one product uh, on the line, which is the HDV6 uh, injector. But we have different types of that injector which are uh, long types or short types for different customers. And if you have different geometry, you have to set up the line in different ways. The idea was to make that switch between different variations and different machine settings as automated as possible. Mm -hmm. So on some machines, some components must be swapped by hand, for example. Uh, different size grippers, for instance. But many settings can be changed automatically by Nexeed's MES. If you say, OK, I want to make 1000 parts of type A, then the line gets that information from the MES system and said, OK, what do I need to produce that parts? And then it will check with the MES system with different modules, product setup management and material control and, and check if the stations has the right parts, and if not, they will say, okay, hello, I need other parts. And then the line automatically change over. Hello, I need other parts. <laughs> so yeah, sweet. exactly. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So the, the machines have basically automated their own supply ordering. That's wild. I love it. And what's also interesting is how that changeover works. Normally, only the head station, so the first station of the line, will get the trigger to change over the line. And then the first station will change over and send a changeover workpiece carrier to the other stations. That the other stations will change over directly after that. Uh, um, can you illuminate for me how is workpiece carrier working? So every part travels through the production line in a carrier. When the production switches from one model to another, a special empty carrier travels through the line and tells every machine that it passes to make the respective change. Okay, got it. So in the beginning of the line, it, you can already produce type, you know, type B of the valve, mm -hmm. uh, while the end still finishes making type A. So somewhere in the middle, the carrier tells one machine, okay, after the next one, get ready for type B. Exactly. That's, that's pretty clever. Mm -hmm. And it's one way how Nexeed helps make manufacturing more efficient. Plus, I think it's a great example for marrying the physical and digital world. So 
that physical object traveling through the production line, triggering a digital protocol to change certain settings, which then again affects physical products. And I mean, that's really some out of the box thinking. That's, I think that's my main takeaway from this episode is trying to get away from that pure technical focus of things. Mm -hmm. Like Marian said in the beginning, you know, you need to think about the culture and the organization as well. You know, it's not just a software solution. There's, there's a lot of people that have a lot of experience on their own. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of process that they need to, they need to think about, mm -hmm. um, or think also about the actual physical things that the digital world is connecting to. And that's what's exciting about this is that we're only seeing the beginning of IIoT and Industry 4.0. Mm -hmm. So Tobias started working with more data scientists to get even more benefits from his vast data collection. But there's still a little bit of a disappointing aspect. We're already at the end of this episode mm -hmm. and I'm still not getting my bingo. I'm really close, oh. but I'm still not there. Oh, uh, okay. Well, let's see. Um, so Industry 4.0. So I already have that uh, one. Factory of the Future. Uh, no. No? Uh, no. Process Curves. I have it, but it's on a different line. <laughs> uh, predictive Maintenance. Yes! Bingo! So there you go. Now you're a winner today. Unfortunately, I didn't win the quiz. Marian did, but can I still get a prize anyway? Well, you helped me get the bingo, so I'll share mine. I like that. And as a bonus as well, you get to record another episode with moi next month. And I couldn't <laughs> more be more excited for? about this one. And I'll let you guess why. Um, because we're going to do it in French. <laughs> I would love to get this one, but no, it's a, a little bit more close to my heart. So what is it? What's the topic? Motorbikes. And listeners, if you like motorbikes too, you should definitely not miss this one. That sounds great. I like four wheels, I like seat belts, I like roll cages, <laughs> air conditioning, you know, stuff like that. The air conditioning is the air that gets blown in your face all the time. <laughs> From know-how to wow. Talk to you next month and thank you for listening. Bye. The Bosch Global Podcast.